This is the mimic octopus. But not all of its behaviors are camouflage. Sometimes the mimic octopus dons stripes and walks along with its arms sticking out like the spines of a lionfish. Because this is definitely not camouflage. Somewhere in the waters of the Indian and Pacific Ocean off the coast of Indonesia inside a sandy burrow on a silty flat, about 400 tightly clinging eggs lie hidden. And now you emerge from one of them, drifting upward to join a cloud of your siblings in the vast blue void around you. Wait, is that your mom over there? She drew her last breath the moment the first eggs cracked open. Perfect timing for a traumatic exit. In fact, that's just the way it goes for female mimic octopuses. There's no time for mourning. There's a hell awaiting you. You and hundreds of your siblings are now floating as plankton, drifting wherever the currents decide to take you. Just tiny, transparent parcels of potential, each about two millimeters long. Wait. Oh. Nice. Their journey is over before it truly began. Well, more than 99% of you are going to get eaten in the first month. Let's see if you can make the 1%. If you think about it, you've got a better chance of winning the lottery than actually surviving. Right now, you're in the paralarval stage, or what scientists call baby octopuses. You're basically transparent, with a few brown pigment cells starting to develop. Your body's still growing, but those eight little arms already know what to do, pulsing rhythmically to keep you afloat, even though each one's no longer than an eyelash. The next few weeks are all about surviving. You're drifting with countless other tiny creatures in the ocean's soup. You can't sink to the bottom yet, and you're stuck up here in the danger zone, where everything's e- Oh, there goes another group of your siblings. No biggie. You'll get used to it. Actually, you look like a floating cloud of cotton candy. Every time some creature comes along, takes a bite, and disappears. Though your translucent body and tiny size give you some protection, it's mostly luck that keeps you alive out here. When you feel a bit hungry, you start feeding on the smaller plankton swimming beside you, your microscopic beak already capable of cracking open the shells of copepods and other mini crustaceans. During these first few weeks, you grow rapidly, fueled by a rich diet in these protein-packed morsels. After like three to six weeks of stuffing your face and dodging danger by pure luck, you've finally outgrown the paralarval stage. Now you're about the size of a tiny grape, chubby enough to sink, and ready to kick off a whole new life on the ocean floor. As you sink into deeper waters, the scenery changes dramatically. No more endless blue, now it's just a landscape of sand, mud, coral outcrops, and the occasional patch of seagrass. Your first day on the sea floor starts rough. Two goby fish spot you and dart in your direction. Instinct kicks in and your skin cells fire in a neurological miracle. Your entire body transforms, darkening to match the murky bottom. See? I told you go surreal. Chill. I trust you. Let's go give everyone the scoop. That's not perfect, because you're still learning, but it's enough to make them hesitate just long enough for you to scoot under a shell fragment. Your heart races, pumping copper-based blue blood through your three hearts at a frantic pace. Yes, three hearts. One main heart and two brachial hearts that pump blood through your gills. Talk about cardiovascular overachievement. By two months old, you've reached your juvenile stage. You're now about two inches long. You're also discovering something interesting about yourself. You're different from other octopuses. When that moray eel cruised by your den yesterday, something clicked in your brain. Instead of just changing color, your entire body seemed to rearrange itself. Your arms lined up in formation, and your skin developed stripes, and suddenly, you weren't an octopus anymore. You looked like a toxic flatfish. It was clumsy, more like a kid wearing their parents' clothes, but it's enough to make the eel realize that dealing with a toxic flatfish is not on his to-do list. Later that day, you try again. This time deliberately, you rise up, stretch two arms above your head, and flatten the others against the sea floor. You turn black and yellow. You're a venomous sea snake now. Looks convincing. You're the only known octopus species that can impersonate multiple animals on demand. Your brain's making connections faster than any other animal your size. And that distributed nervous system means each arm can problem solve independently while your central brain coordinates the big picture. When you reach under that rock to grab a crab, your arm is literally thinking for itself. Feeling, tasting, deciding, all without consulting your main brain. Kind of salty. It's like having eight smart assistants that sometimes go rogue. Oh, look, a lionfish hovering nearby. Its venomous spines fanned out in deadly display. Something clicks in your advanced brain. Your body stretches, and fins seem to sprout from your sides, and your arms rearrange themselves to mimic the lionfish's spines. Great, you've just discovered your signature weapon, mimicry. Despite not having a single bone in your body, you're one of the most intelligent invertebrates on the planet. That intelligence is now devoted to one thing, staying alive through deception. You can process multiple threats simultaneously, deciding in milliseconds which creature to impersonate for the best chance of survival. Three months in, and you're about five inches now, with arms that can stretch nearly a foot when fully extended. Your repertoire of impersonations grows daily. 
You've learned to mimic a dozen or so different marine animals, each one perfectly tailored to whatever threat is present. Oh, wait. A barracuda's coming at you. Time to use that Ben 10 Omni tricks. Hmm. Sea snake. Good choice. The barracuda veers away immediately. Even apex predators don't mess with sea snakes. Minutes later, you detect the vibrations of a mantis shrimp approaching, and you instantly switch tactics. Compressing your body and extending two arms to mimic a toxic flatfish, complete with eye spots. The mantis shrimp, capable of striking with the force of a 22 caliber bullet, gives you a wide berth. This chameleonic ability isn't just for defense. It becomes your hunting strategy, too. Let's find a crispy crab to show you how it's done. You creep across the bottom, perfectly matching the sand, only your eyes giving away your position. There it is, oblivious to your presence until it's too late. Your arms shoot out, guided by suction cups lined with chemo receptors so sensitive they can taste what they touch. Mmm, delicious. There's a price for these abilities, though. Your metabolism runs at a frantic pace, requiring constant feeding. Unlike most octopuses who hide in dens, you're often exposed, traveling across open stretches of seafloor in search of food. This is when you're most vulnerable. Oh, what's that shadow? A grouper spotted you despite your camouflage. There's no time to hide. The seafloor here is barren mud. Hmm. You still have another ultimate backup plan. Ink. A cloud of dark melaton erupts from your body, temporarily blinding the grouper. But you don't just jet away like other octopuses. You can take it a step further. As you shoot backwards, your body morphs again, this time into a jellyfish pulsing through the water column. The confused grouper searches the ink cloud while you drift away in plain sight, disguised as something entirely different. Four months into your life, you're still growing. About nine inches now. You've established a territory. A modest patch of mixed habitat including sand flats, coral rubble, and seagrass. This variety of backgrounds gives you maximum flexibility for your disguises. You rarely sleep in the same place twice, instead finding temporary shelter under rocks or in abandoned shells, your boneless body able to squeeze through openings no wider than a coin. Your daily routine's a masterclass in survival. You hunt at dawn and dusk when changing light conditions make it harder for predators to spot your movements. During daylight hours, you travel cautiously, constantly shifting your appearance to match your surroundings. Sometimes you crawl along using your arms like a strange underwater spider. Six months old now, and you're the size of a small melon. You start to feel something... different. Your body tingles with unfamiliar sensations. Oh, it's puberty. Yes, even mimic octopuses go through that awkward phase, though thankfully you don't have to worry about voice cracks or acne. Instead, your hormones are telling you something important. It's time to find a mate. For most octopuses, this would be a simple affair, but you're a mimic octopus and nothing in your life is straightforward. The dating scene for your kind is ridiculously complex. Imagine if humans had to impersonate different celebrities to attract partners. Actually, come to think of it. You spot another mimic octopus in the distance, a female, slightly smaller than you. She's currently doing her best lionfish impression, and frankly, it's a 10 out of 10 performance. Your heart skips several beats. Approaching a female mimic is tricky business. If you startle her, she might mistake you for a predator and jet away. Worse, she might think you're trying to steal her signature moves. It's like approaching someone at a costume party when you're both dressed as Batman. Mm, that was a dumb example I just gave. Sorry, let's keep going. You decide on a bold strategy. Instead of mimicking a dangerous creature, you transform into the most dazzling display you can manage. Half of your body turns bright white, while the other half displays pulsating patterns of brown and beige. It's the mimic octopus equivalent of a peacock's tail, and it serves one purpose. Hey, I'm the same species as you, and I'm absolutely fabulous. The female seems interested, and cautiously approaching. Now comes the truly bizarre part of mimic octopus courtship. You extend one specialized arm towards her. Yes, that arm. In octopuses, one arm's modified into what scientists delicately call a hectocoitalus, essentially a sperm delivery package. I did not need to see that. The female accepts your genetic offering, storing it in a special pouch until she's ready to fertilize her eggs. The entire courtship lasts just minutes. No dinner, no dances, not even a call me later. Okay, let's assume you're a female instead of a male. Unlike the male who can mate multiple times, you'll only reproduce once in your lifetime. Talk about pressure. No wonder you're so picky about who gets to donate their genes to your future offspring. After mating, you start stockpiling energy, eating twice as much as usual. Your body needs enough reserves, because what comes next is the ultimate act of maternal sacrifice. And after about a week, the time comes. You begin searching for the perfect den to lay your eggs. A protected spot, but one that allows enough water flow to provide oxygen. Yeah, this place is perfect. Time to get to work. Your body begins producing eggs, hundreds of peppercorn-sized capsules, barely three millimeters long. As they emerge, you string the eggs like tiny pearls on short stalks under the den roof, 
hundreds swaying in the current, attaching each one with a special secretion that hardens in seawater. The process takes hours, and by the end you've produced between 300 to 400 eggs. Each contains the potential for a new master of disguise. They hang from the ceiling like tiny translucent grapes. What a view. Now begins the most devoted period of your life. For the next month, you barely eat. Just the odd midnight snack. Because every twitch of an arm goes into fanning those eggs, focusing all your energy on protecting and caring for your brood. Day and night, you tend to your eggs. Using your arms, you gently waft fresh, oxygen-rich water over them. You remove any algae or debris that might foster bacteria. Any predator foolish enough to approach gets the full mimic octopus treatment. You become whatever creature would terrify them most. As the days go by, your body begins to change. Your once vibrant colors start to fade. Your muscles weaken. This is senescence, programmed death that ensures you'll protect your eggs until they're ready to hatch. Your entire physiology is shifting focus from keep this body alive to ensure these eggs survive. A month into your egg tending, you notice changes in the eggs themselves. The embryos are larger now, their eyes visible as tiny dark spots. They're almost ready. Your body knows this too. You've grown weaker by the day. Finally, after 60-80 to 80 days of brooding, your life's purpose is complete, though you won't live to see the moment of hatching. Your body, having given everything to protect the developing eggs, finally gives out before they hatch. But, if you're a male, life goes on after mating, but it's far from smooth sailing. Your existence becomes even riskier now, thanks to the need to roam widely in search of more mates and food. Seven months old, you're now the size of a large melon, with arms stretching nearly two feet when fully extended. Your camouflage skills are impeccable, and your repertoire of impersonations grows continuously. But, age is catching up quick. You're aware that mimic octopuses live fast and die young. Most of your kind rarely reach their first birthday. Your final months are spent exploring farther than ever. Your body pulses with restless energy, urging you to travel through vast expanses of sandy plains and coral gardens, visiting every nook and cranny of your territory. You find other females, repeat the courtship dance, and continue your genetic legacy. One day, while crossing an open stretch of sand, you sense a vibration. Oh, a giant trembly speeds toward you with deadly intent. Instinctively, your body twists into a convincing sea snake impersonation, black and white bands vividly displayed. He don't look convinced. That was close. Time for plan B. Ink. You dart away, rapidly shifting into a jellyfish-like form to confuse your attacker. But you're slightly slower this time. Exhaustion from constant mating and hunting is taking its toll. Your muscles strain, barely evading the snapping jaws. A sharp pain shoots through one of your arms. The trembly caught just the tip, but thankfully, octopuses can regenerate limbs. You retreat to safety, wounded but alive, knowing you're nearing the end of your journey. Weeks pass, and your energy continues to fade. Your final act is finding a safe, hidden nook among coral and shells, where you settle into a quiet existence.